All right, well, now we have the star of the show, the sponsor of our wonderful journalism round, our journalism uh, boot camp here, uh, Dr. Joel Premack, whom you guys all know and who was introduced yesterday. So without further ado, here you are. Fortunately, uh, we've had many stars of the show. Of course, after uh, uh, this, we're going to have this uh, roundtable with a number of the journalists uh, and uh, we'll get a chance, and, and faculty, we'll have a chance to uh, have more of a discussion. So what I'm going to do is talk uh, about simulating galaxies and the universe. And of course, uh, I'm going to emphasize my own group's work because I know it best and I've got the videos on my laptop and so forth. But I'll also refer to uh, some of the competing work. So you've seen this picture many times. This is the uh, ultra deep field as taken by the advanced camera for surveys. We now have a new camera installed by the astronauts in 2009 on the last visit to Hubble, the uh, wide field camera three, which has also taken the same region now in the infrared and the ultraviolet. Uh, now, the trouble with this image is that although it's very beautiful and extremely useful, it's very misleading because it's only showing about half of 1% of the cosmic density. 99.5% of the universe is invisible. The universe, as you've now been told many times, is mostly made of dark matter and dark energy. And uh, in the popular books that my wife and I have written, we decided that we need to have a, a friendly name for this. And we propose the double dark theory. Dark matter, dark energy. And uh, if you Google double dark, at least the first 10 pages or so is all fun, good stuff like chocolate and coffee and chocolate and coffee combination and things like that. Uh, the technical name is lambda CDM. Lambda for the cosmological constant, that's the Greek symbol that Einstein used for it, or some more general form of, of dark energy. And of course, CDM, cold dark matter. I introduced this terminology of hot, warm, and cold back in 1983, and it caught on. Now, uh, a way of picturing the contents of the universe is this picture, which is a pyramid. I hope you can see the, the outlines of the pyramid where the dark energy is about 70%, the cold dark matter is about 25%, and everything else is about 5%. But although there's about 4% of invisible atoms out in between the galaxies, not lit up by stars, not stars, all we see is the little bit of visible matter, the half a percent. And of course, the heavy elements, the stuff we're made of and the Earth is made of, is a hundredth of 1%, the rarest stuff in the entire universe. So imagine that the entire universe is an ocean of dark energy. On that ocean sail billions of ghostly ships made of dark matter. But we don't see the ships and we don't see the ocean. All we see are these beacons on the tops of the tallest mass of the biggest ships. Those are the galaxies. And we have to deduce everything from the little bit that we can see. Incidentally, uh, Nancy, all the, the pretty prose and beautiful ideas are due to Nancy, and in particular, uh, this uh, uh, way of thinking about it. Uh, now, why would anybody believe this? And the reason is that with just a small number of adjustable parameters, six primarily, the, the theory naturally explains all the large-scale structure of the universe, starting with the heat radiation of the Big Bang. So this is what we call the uh, temperature angular power spectrum of the cosmic background radiation. And it was already essentially predicted the basic shape by the cold dark matter theory with a the cosmological constant. You adjust the parameters ever so slightly to get a perfect match. And then every one of these white points, which are independent measurements by WMAP, and also these ground-based measurements in color from these experiments, and then there's some new experiments that are coming in. Uh, the agreement is as good as you could ever hope for. There are no discrepancies. So that's the uh, heat radiation of the Big Bang. But 
the theory not only fits the Big Bang and the heat radiation that was released about 400,000 years after, it also fits the distribution of matter on all scales we can measure down to the really small ones. And that's shown by this picture. So this is the predicted spectrum of fluctuations in the cold dark matter theory, small scales to very big scales, 10 orders of magnitude. And you just couldn't ask for a better fit. So the theory, as many people have already told you, but I wanted to give you some sense of just how good it is. And I could show you many more pictures of this sort that are just as good. The point is, there aren't any bad ones. People will look very hard to see any contradictions. There are no contradictions that are known between the predictions of this theory and the large-scale structure of the universe. Because it does so well, we now want to really look carefully at how structure forms in this theory so that we can then, of course, test the theory some more, but also use this to understand the evolution of the part we can see, in particular, the galaxies, the clusters of galaxies, that sort of thing. So how do we do this with simulations? Astronomical observations are snapshots. We get an image of what a distant galaxy looked like at some moment of time. And just as if we had a bunch of pictures of individuals at different stages of their life cycle, with galaxies, we have to piece together the full movie. And that's where theory comes in. The job of theorists is to make potential movies. And then if the individual snapshots that we get from the universe fit the pattern that the theory suggests, we can begin to understand how it all fits together. And as uh, several people said, uh, and uh, especially Mark Krumholtz emphasized this morning, the purpose of the simulations is insight. The, the whole job of science is to help us understand the universe around us on all different scales, including, of course, the living universe. Now, there are two different kinds of simulations that I'm going to discuss. Cosmological scale simulations, where we are doing thousands of millions of light years, billions of light years across, you know, billions and billions. That, that's one class. And on those scales, we can get away with just doing the dark matter. And that's great because, as people have emphasized, that's basically F equals MA, except, of course, we do it in an uh, Einsteinian way. Uh, the other thing is to actually get down into the gastrophysics and understand how galaxies work. And for that, we have to do what we call hydrodynamic galaxy simulations. And the hydrodynamic means that we're including all the effects of ordinary matter, gas, turning into stars and black holes and radiating and pushing things around. And, uh, and that's a very, very complicated business. And there's no hope that we'll be able to understand all of this without constantly working with the observations. The amazing thing was that we were actually able to create this cold dark matter theory, or a small class of such theories varying the parameters, by pure thought. And it actually fits the universe. So, and, the, and basically what that means is, this was a really simple problem. This is a very tough problem. This has not been solved at all. This is largely solved, although, of course, the dark matter may be a little bit more complicated than we thought. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the cosmological dark matter simulations, and then we'll talk about the hydrodynamic ones. Uh, the uh, drunk on the stoop is saying to his friend, quarks, neutrinos, mesons, all those damn particles you can't see, that's what drove me to drink. But now I can see them. <laughs> Now you, too, will see the dark matter. And uh, this is to remind me to tell you that everything you're going to see in the images I'm about to show you that's bright and light and so forth is actually invisible. It's dark matter. If somebody could close some of those uh, dark shades, uh, these videos are going to work better. This first one, fortunately, uh, you won't need the dark shade. So, Uh, is the sound on, Will? 
Because there's actually music that goes with Oh, actually, that may be my computer that's the problem. No, actually, so it's not putting out. I've connected the sound. OK, it's not crucial. Let, let me run this back again. So what this is is a little region of the expanding universe that's going to make a galaxy. And it's expanding and expanding and expanding. And now it's pretty much stopped expanding in the middle, see? And now it's actually starting to fall together. This little blob is still flying away. Some of this stuff is actually heading in. So that's what it looks like in the expanding universe. Previously, you've seen a number of simulations where we're taking out the expansion, not showing you the expansion. This one's nice because it shows you the expansion. OK, so that's now reached the present moment. I is there uh, a possibility to turn on sound, Will? Th I know it's built in. Oh, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> uh, Will, you just put on TV. <laughs> Let let's go back to the computer. Uh-oh. You asked for too much. Joe. I know. <laughs> That's right. You noticed there was no sound with the TV either. Yeah, OK. Let's forget the sound. There's some beautiful music that Nancy wrote that I wanted you to hear, but all right. OK, no, no sound. But uh, can we get back the, uh, the video? So anyway, what happened is that the central region, the one that stopped expanding, reached this roughly 200 times the background density. And it decoupled from the expansion of the universe. The rest of the universe continued to expand. It stopped expanding. And what that means is that the universe Uh-oh. I, I think the sound is back. So that actually divided into two different regions. Uh-oh, maybe, so maybe it's my computer. Okay, well, I, I'm sending. Two different regions, which Nancy proposes that we call tame space and wild space. You've all heard people use the term outer space. All that means is above the Earth's atmosphere. Not a particularly useful distinction. But tame space is the space where gravity is in control. Those are the regions that aren't expanding anymore. Wild space is the region in between the local group of galaxies, other little groups of galaxies, and clusters of galaxies, the regions that are bound together by gravity. And the wild space is being torn apart by the dark energy, which is becoming increasingly important because as the universe expands, the dark energy seems to be a property of space, as far as we can tell. And there's more and more dark energy as there's more space. But the matter just thins out. Ah, great, we've got the, uh, the visuals back. So uh, this was just a few moments from that expansion. This is the end of expansion for this halo. This is tame space. That's wild space. Thanks, Will. I think the, the picture is OK. So now, uh, how big is the Milky Way galaxy compared to this beautiful Aquarius simulation by Volker Springle and colleagues? And the answer is, that's how big. The visible galaxies are tiny compared to these dark matter halos that have all this substructure. How does this fit in to the cosmic web? Watch. About like that. Wow. So now let's look at a little bit of the cosmic web, but considerably larger than the region that hosts the galaxy, a region that hosts a cluster of galaxies. There's, there's a dark matter halo for a cluster of galaxies. But let's look at it up close. So this is the dark matter halo of a cluster. And this is the region around that. And we're rotating it to give you a sense of the three dimensionality. And then we're going to move the camera in closer so that you can get a better sense of how it works. What you see is this pattern of filaments of dark matter with the little blobs that represent the halos that would host one or two galaxies the size of the Milky Way. And then these bigger clumps would host groups. And a really big clump would host 
thousands of galaxies, including dozens the size of the Milky Way. And of course, we have catalogs now of thousands of clusters. And we're going to find thousands more and study them. As Kim explained, one of the ways we're going to understand the nature of the dark energy is going to be to do that. Uh, incidentally, Bjork loved this video so much that she asked for us to give her a high-def version, which of course we were happy to. Everybody can have all of these things. Uh, they're on the new-universe.org website. They're on the HIPAC website. Uh, and apparently she's using this in her uh, concert tour. And she has a, a cut that's called Dark Matter, and that's what she plays during the Dark Matter. Uh, now, the Millennium Simulation was a path-breaking simulation. You've seen it referred to many times. And of course, uh, the point of this is to show that you can blow up this little region into this and blow up a little tiny bit of that and blah, blah, blah. And, and it was a fantastic achievement for 2005. It's been the basis of 400 papers, more than 400 papers, in the literature that have addressed all of these different issues. The characteristics of the halos, how the halos join together to make subsequent halos, uh, how galaxies form within these halos, et cetera, et cetera. There's only one little problem. The Millennium Simulation was based on cosmological parameters, two in particular, omega matter, that's the fraction of cosmic density that's in matter, dark matter and ordinary matter. And uh, they assumed uh, something like this, 20, 0.25, and that's a millennium. And this other parameter, sigma 8, which measures the amplitude of the fluctuations, basically how strong the fluctuations are on a particular scale. And uh, as you see, the first year report from Wilkinson Micro Vanasatri Probe had huge errors. The, that's the, the sort of cross thing. And you know, they made a reasonable choice. That's what they chose. Well, then there was a five-year, uh, there was a three-year report, which was about as different from this one as it could be without being completely contradictory. And then there was a five-year, and then there was, in 2010, a seven-year report. I'm not sure there's going to be any other report from WMAP. The funding is over. And Planck is going to uh, have a report next year. But you can see that there seems to be some convergence now. Moreover, the other data from ground-based uh, experiments mostly has now improved tremendously. These are a bunch of different measurements involving x-rays, visible light, and gravitational lensing. And they are extremely consistent with the results from WMAP. And the result is that we now pretty much know the cosmological parameters. They're pretty much in this region. The problem is, that that is four sigma away from millennium, which means that the chance of millennium being right, just on a statistical basis, is far less than one in a thousand. Yes? Can I just interrupt you and can you give us an explanation of what sigma actually is? What's three sigma, five sigma? Okay, here's the actual technical definition. In linear theory, it is the fluctuation amplitude, oh, which Oh, I'm sorry, all right. that's sigma 8. OK, error bar sigma, that means that there's about a 68% chance, statistically, that the truth is within that, uh, that circle. That's a three sigma? That's one, one sigma. sigma. Okay. okay. Uh, two sigma, you're 95%. Three sigma, you're 99 point something percent. OK, five sigma. Anyway, the, the point is, millennium is wrong. There's simply no question. It's just wrong. And uh, the person, the sort of senior person, uh, Simon White, is extremely stubborn, and they continue to use these wrong parameters. And what it means is that although people told you that there's fantastically good agreement between millennium and large-scale structure, when you look carefully, there's not. And uh, the papers that they've put out, their most recent paper, Guo et al., Guo White et al., which I was the referee of, uh, admits that they're predicting that the number of galaxies like the Milky Way that are separated at a distance of about three million light years is off by a factor of two from reality. And there are many other things that you can point out that are wrong. And this isn't what I'm telling you, it's what they're telling you, and they're saying it's because they have the wrong parameters. 
Moreover, computers keep getting better, and so there's no reason we can't do a much better simulation, much higher resolution than they've done. So we did. So this is the Bolshoi simulation. Uh, the papers were published last year. Uh, the data is publicly available. We're going to have another data release soon. We'll release a lot more of the information from this simulation. And there's a website, which is just highpack.ucsc.edu slash Bolshoi. And uh, all of you should have gotten in your packets the article that uh, uh, Trudy is holding up. It's by Trudy and me, and it's in the July issue of Sky and Telescope magazine. It's the feature article. So, uh, Remember, all of these uh, slides are going to be online, and also uh, it's all been video recorded. But anyway, uh, so we released all the catalogs in last September. We're going to release the merger trees, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute, uh, very soon. So this is a very big simulation. It's much higher resolution than people did before. Of course, there will be better simulations coming along, because the computers keep getting better, and the codes are probably getting better. Let me show you some of the things that we've done with the Bolshoi simulation. So that's our galaxy, and that's the large and small Magellanic Cloud, two big satellite galaxies, unusually bright satellite galaxies. And the question is, how likely is it? Well, in the simulation, we've got Millions of galaxies. We are certainly complete to galaxies as bright as the large and small Magellanic Cloud. So we can just count in the simulation. In the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there's a region that's been surveyed sufficiently deeply that we can count there. The agreement is really good. And if you actually make a statistical comparison, the number of Milky Way-sized galaxies with no bright satellites with one such bright satellite, with two such bright satellites, with three, with four, with five. The black is the statistics from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They only have a few thousand Milky Way analogs that we've studied deeply enough that we can do this measurement. We have so many within the Bolshoi simulation that there's essentially no errors. But the agreement is as good as you could hope for. So this is an example of how you can test whether these simulations are right. We've done a much bigger simulation. This is 64 times the volume of Bolshoi. Of course, we can't see all the little galaxies, but we can see lots and lots of clusters, and we can study the properties of clusters. And uh, we found that the uh, clusters, uh, the properties of the clusters agree extremely well with the observed properties of clusters. So if we show you a big simulation, and we show it to you expanding with the universe, it's going to look like the top set of images. And the problem is you won't be able to see what's happening until the thing expands up to pretty much full size. And so what we've been showing you, what a number of the, of the earlier speakers have shown you, is the evolution of a region of the universe where you don't show the expansion. You blow everything up to the final size. We call that working in co-moving coordinates. So I'm going to show that to you now, and I'm going to show you an evolution picture that we did for the opening of the most advanced planetarium in the world, the new Adler Planetarium, the Granger Sky Theater at the Adler Planetarium, with 8,000 pixels across, uh, 20 brand new projectors. And uh, it's basically IMAX in a dome. Of course, <laughs> I don't have 8,000 pixels across. Uh, so this is a simulation of the local region of the universe. And you see the dark matter flowing along the filaments toward the regions where filaments cross and these great dark matter halos that would host clusters form. Now this has been a constrained simulation. It's a constrained local universe simulation program, the CLUES program. And so what this does is it lets us simulate the local universe, including the Milky Way and Andromeda and the Virgo cluster and so on. We're just flying through it right now. The simulation has finished and we can just fly through it and enjoy the view. And uh, pretty soon we're going to pass the Milky Way. But I warn you, uh, you're probably not going to be able to see which one of these little blobs hosts the Milky Way. 
basically, the reason that we're doing this is just to give you a sense of what the universe looks like if you just look at the dark matter. And of course, there's filaments, and where the filaments cross, there's these great dark matter halos that host clusters, and the smaller dark matter halos that host groups of a few bright galaxies. And we're actually passing the Milky Way right now. Since you asked. Yeah. Okay. So Fine. let me just show you. This little guy is the dark matter halo that hosts us. That little guy is the dark matter halo that hosts the Andromeda galaxy. And this little guy is actually a foreground interloper and has nothing to do with it. It just happens to be along the same direction. And so now what I'm going to do is play the end of the last video starting at this point. OK, so there it was. There are actually reasons why it's interesting to set up the simulation so that it actually pretty close represents the local region of the universe. You can make predictions that are more specific to being tested locally. So that's one of the reasons we did this. Just for the computer f uh, uh, aficionados, we stored 7,200 time steps of a billion particles each. That's 340 terabytes of data. We dumped that data in about two days. It took about 200,000 CPU hours to run this little simulation, which is peanuts compared to the Bolshoi simulation, which took about 10 million CPU hours altogether. Uh, we did this so that we could show, uh, I think it was three minutes of uh, 30 frames a second with no interpolation. Now, what this shows is something quite remarkable. Every one of these little blobs is a dark matter halo that's all going to end up inside one big cluster. And you're seeing them forming and coming together. And every one of these little blobs is going to host a forming galaxy. So, and these are all big enough that they really would host a forming galaxy. So there are going to be thousands and thousands of galaxies in a big dark matter cluster. And we actually follow every single dark matter halo, down to much smaller than the large and small Magellanic clouds in this great big simulation. Why do we do that? Because what we really want to do, besides checking that the dark matter theory is right, is to understand the galaxies, not just individual galaxies, but the entire population of galaxies. And we want to understand it in all different environments. So how do we understand galaxies? Now, there's a big problem that people pointed out years ago with the whole cold dark matter scheme. As people have pointed out several times already, in dark matter, cold dark matter, Structure forms from small to big. First, little baby dark matter halos form, and they clump together and clump together and clump together, and that makes bigger and bigger dark matter halos. But when we study galaxies, we find that the biggest galaxies host the oldest stars, which means that the stars must have formed earliest. Isn't this exactly the opposite of cold dark matter? And the key to understanding that, no, there's no contradiction, is in this picture, which was actually in the original cold dark matter paper by George Blumenthal, now the chancellor at UCSC, Sandy Faber, whom you heard last night, me, and Martin Rees, who recently retired as the president of the Royal Society of England. So this was published back in 1984, and it's our, it's our big cold dark matter paper. And this was figure three. And I can't go into the details in the small amount of time we have, but under these so-called cooling curves, is where you expect galaxies to form. And outside the cooling curves is where you expect to have groups and clusters of galaxies. This was the data on groups and clusters that was available when we published this paper in 1984 from the very first sky survey that had redshifts and so on. And this was the data on galaxies. And what you see is that the galaxies are basically in this band. This is 10 to the 8 solar mass halos, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12. You see the numbers here. Basically, what you're seeing is that galaxies have to form below the cooling curves, but they don't form efficiently until you're up to about 10 to the 10 solar masses. And that turns out to explain the whole story for the following reason. 
If you have a star forming band that starts at about 10 to the 10 solar masses and goes up to about 10 to the 12 solar masses, our own galaxy's halo is about 10 to the 12 solar masses, what's going to happen is as the dark matter halos grow in mass as time increases this way, remember everything in astronomy is backwards, so we always plot everything in a funny way. You always have to pay attention. So what's going to happen is that the dark matter halos are going to cross that band and then they're going to keep growing, but you aren't going to form any stars because you're above the mass where stars will form. So massive galaxies start forming stars early, like that purple curve. They shut down early. They're red, meaning their power, the light's mainly coming out of old red, red giant stars. That's most of the light in those galaxies comes from. So they really are reddish. And they populate dark halos that are much more massive than their stellar mass. Whereas small galaxies, that cyan curve, start forming stars late because they only enter the band late. They're still making stars today. They're blue, which means they have these bright young stars that only live millions of years, but put out a lot of energy in ultraviolet and blue. And they populate dark matter halos that match their stellar mass. And this is the natural explanation why we see this so-called downsizing phenomenon, namely that the oldest stars are in the biggest galaxies. Star formation is a wave that starts in the largest galaxies, like galaxy halos, and sweeps down to smaller and smaller ones. So we build all of that plus a great deal more shock heating and radiative cooling, uh, ionization, merging, star formation, supernova heating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, into our model that we, that's sufficiently simplified. It's one of these semi-numerical or semi-analytic models that we can follow millions of galaxies in all these dark matter halos simultaneously. We use the merger tree, all the different things that merge and merge and merge to make one object today. And we do this for every single dark matter halo in the large region. And then we can populate the dark matter halos. Now this is a very funny diagram from, this is from a paper that was just submitted a few days ago to publication and put on the archive so anybody can read it. Guillermo Barro et al. This is the latest data from Hubble Space Telescope, the Candel survey, more about that in a few minutes. And this is diffuse galaxies, compact galaxies, blue means they're star forming, red means they've stopped forming stars, compact, diffuse. High redshift, lower, 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 lower today. Well, not quite today, but nearly late universe. So you see a certain pattern of motion. And mainly what you're seeing is that you have a lot of these diffuse star forming galaxies that make more and more compact star forming galaxies, which quickly become, it turns out, compact non-star forming galaxies. And the amazing thing is that our semi-analytic model that was tuned to match the nearby universe basically sees exactly the same phenomenon. And to give you a sense of how this works, this is how the galaxies move around in this picture. And we can, because we can follow you know, thousands or millions of galaxies, uh, this is a special subset of the galaxies that we, that we chose to follow. And we can see exactly what's happening, whether they're merging or whatever. Thank you. So in the paper, what we're discovering, using this new data from Hubble Space Telescope, is that there seems to be two ways that galaxies move around in this size, mass, star forming, and non-star forming picture. We have the fast track and the slow track. I, I suggested this terminology, which my observational colleagues picked up on. So the fast track, you get a big diffuse galaxy, which for some reason, for example, galaxy merging, becomes a very compact star forming galaxy, which then becomes quiescent. In other words, it stops forming stars very quickly. And it ends up here as a diffuse, somewhat extended galaxy because of minor merging. Lots of little things join on. The smaller galaxies, the smaller mass galaxies, also start out as diffuse, and they just stop. They run out of gas, and they end up in that same place. So this is the kind of thing where when, we, when my graduate student, Lauren Porter, showed this to the experimentalists, to the observers, and, and also uh, this thing a couple of weeks ago, the observers were absolutely flabbergasted. They had no idea that we could make a model that could actually help them understand 
the way the galaxies evolve. So, uh, and of course, we were somewhat shocked and surprised too, but in a very pleasant way. So of course we're going to be writing papers and following up on this and seeing you know, where the model fails. And so now I want to talk more about where we actually put a huge amount of computer power into just simulating a small number of galaxies, but including all of these phenomena. And not doing it by really rough approximations, but by better approximations. But of course, as uh, several of the speakers have emphasized, we always leave things out because there's just a limit to what, uh, you can, what we understand, what we know how to program, and what we have computer time for. So this is a famous example of two colliding galaxies. It's the central region of, of this image. And uh, it turns out this is the center of one of the galaxies. That's the center of the other galaxy. But practically all the action is occurring in here. There's a lot more star formation occurring here than any place else. But you can't see it because it's obscured by dust. And this is very common. Dust is extremely important. It's, of course, also what we're made of. So we developed the most advanced code in the world. This is my former student, Patrick Janssen, who, after he finished here, went to Harvard and just quit three weeks ago. He still has his NASA support to join SpaceX as one of their senior programmers. So he's, he's just moved out to uh, Huntington Beach, where uh, part of SpaceX is located. Of course, as you know, SpaceX just succeeded in launching with their Falcon rocket, their Dragon spaceship, that not only approached the space station as it was supposed to do, but docked, which was beyond what they ever were expected to do. But they did it successfully. Anyway, so we follow the evolution of the stars to get the right light output based on simulations. And then we follow how the light moves through the dusty media. It gets scattered. It gets absorbed. It gets re-emitted as longer wavelengths. All of that's being tracked by our simulations. And so this is running another simulation to see how these galaxies would look when we observe them. And this is what the spectrum looks like without dust, with dust face on, with dust edge on. So there's a huge effect of dust. This is ultraviolet light, the little bit of visible light here, and infrared light out to long wavelengths. So this is what a galaxy merger looks like when we, for every single image, we run sunrise on it for thousands of images so that I can make a video. So we're not just you know, creating the stars as the galaxies interact uh, and, and following all the heavy elements that are created and so on. But we're then tracking how the light changes through all of this. So that's setting up one of the galaxies, like the Milky Way. And there's another galaxy, like Andromeda. And this is what's going to happen between our galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy in about 3 billion years. They're going to go past each other. It's going to cause a lot of star formation in both galaxies. That's all this blue stuff. And it'll fling some stars out. And the galaxies will separate, but not too far, because now they're gravitationally linked very tightly. And they're going to come back together. There's this beautiful music that Nancy wrote that I wish I could be playing right now. And there the center is just merged, and the black holes are going to merge. And the stars at greater distances are all getting messed up. And the net result is that they're going to form a spheroid of stars, an elliptical galaxy. Does the sun remain in there or do you get kicked out? Uh, T.J. Cox ran a dozen or ran 10 of these simulations. And in eight of them, the sun gets kicked way, way out. <laughs> Remember, this doesn't happen until about, uh, actually, uh, that final part is about 4 billion years from now. Sure. Yes? Does the core merger reactivate a quasar? Yes, yes, yes. It does. There's plenty of gas left. It'll do that. So this is what uh, it will look like. So when the universe is twice its present age, uh, distant galaxies will have disappeared over the cosmic horizon. And this new galaxy, which we might call Milky Andromeda, uh, will eventually become all that's visible. So this is what happens if you run these simulations far into the future. And uh, basically, there isn't anything else visible. The, even the Virgo cluster has gone out of our horizon. Now, that's assuming the dark matter is a cosmological constant. If the dark matter is something else, dark all bets, excuse me, the dark energy. 
If the dark energy is not a cosmological constant, it could cause things to expand faster or slower, or even reverse the expansion and start. We just don't know until we learn more about what the nature of the dark energy is. Um, this is just to say that uh, Patrick Johnson and I published this paper two years ago that explained how you can run simulations like the one I just showed you, the, the, this processing by the dust, 10 times faster using graphic processor units, these special gadgets that come on big computers. And this is an example of some of our other papers uh, where we've uh, simulated galaxies and compared them to real galaxies, and, and they really look very similar. So we can use techniques to measure the number of galaxy mergers by looking at what the weird things look like and how long you'd see galaxies that look like these weird things. And uh, doing that, we actually were able to make a lot of sense of the observations, which people had said were uh, actually uh, inconsistent with each other. And it's because they weren't properly taking into account how long the different observations would see different evidences of galaxy mergers. So for the first time, uh, Jennifer Lotz, who was my former postdoc, Patrick Johnson, T.J. Cox, Darren Croton, Rachel Somerville, all of whom are my former students, and Kyle Stewart, who's a uh, former student from UC Irvine of James Bullock, uh, who was also one of my former students. So this was a, a project that I basically started back in 2004. And it finally paid off with this great paper that was finally published at the end of 2011 that I think establishes what the merger rate is of different kinds of mergers for different kinds of galaxies out to about redshift one and a half. In other words, back to about eight and a half billion years ago. Now, to understand how galaxies form, we have to follow the gas flowing along the filaments into the tiny little region here where a galaxy forms. That's the actual evolution of a galaxy. If you follow the gas, the color is gas density, and the white is stars. And Sandy Faber showed you a beautiful video of this type uh, last night. So what I want you to understand is that we're doing dozens of these simulations. We've already done dozens. We're, we have 40 in the computer right now. Each one runs for about six months. If we use sunrise, and every 100 million years, we take a snapshot of what the uh, galaxy looks like. This is one of those galaxies. This is what it looks like. And you see it changes a lot, because the galaxy is getting hit by various things. And uh, you know, when you see this blue stuff, that means a bunch of new stars formed. Those new stars only last a few million years. We're storing many, many time steps, but it's expensive to run the sunrise code on this. So we're not visualizing all of them. But you know, pretty soon you start to see things that look like nearby galaxies that you're familiar with. OK, well, you get the idea. So this is an image of the central region where a galaxy is forming. This is a blow up of this galaxy from one of those simulations. This is face on. This is the same galaxy now looked at edge on. And this is the same galaxy, but now looking at what it would, this is the gas. This is the stars. Now that's a real galaxy from a Hubble image. This is this galaxy now looking at it face on, but now looking not at the gas, but at the stars. This is another Hubble image of another galaxy. Of course, you can't see this galaxy with Hubble at the same time as you see it face on. You know, you only get one view. But we get lots of galaxies. This is gas. And we've written a paper where we analyze the gas and determine what we'd see if we see quasars looking through the at different points of the gas. And we have lots of examples of those observations. So we've mocked that up. So this is the Candell survey. Candell's is a powerful imaging survey of the distant universe being carried out with the two most useful cameras on Hubble Space Telescope. After the astronauts put the Wide Field Camera 3 on Hubble, there was this huge competition to get enormous access to Hubble, and we won. Sandy Faber wrote the leading proposal. It was a shotgun marriage with uh, a proposal by 
uh, Harry Ferguson from Space Telescope Science Institute, which we are happy to join with. We have over 900 orbits of Hubble. It's going to continue for another two years almost. And every month we get about 10,000 images of galaxies like this. This is the uh, H-band 1.6 micron camera on Hubble, Wide Field Camera 3. And this lets us see what these galaxies look like in visible light that left this, in other words, the light our eyes see, that left this galaxy, these galaxies, 10 billion years ago or more. This is what we had to work with before that new camera. This is ultraviolet light from those same galaxies that left them as ultraviolet. Look at the improvement. So, <clears throat> well, you know, this is basically telling you how great this is. But if you want to see lots more, candles.uclick.org. And what are we doing? Well, we're pretending those galaxies that I showed you close up are actually located at redshift two or more. In other words, the light's been traveling for more than 10 billion years. The images are small. The telescope has finite resolution, not space telescope, but still these are these fine, fine, you know, little baby images that you saw in the ultra deep field, for example. And this is what uh, they look like if we don't include dust. And when we include dust, it has a big effect. So these are the simulated galaxies and with noise and so forth added. This is H-band. This is what we would see with the advanced camera for surveys. And of course, we have all the data in all these bands. And now what we're trying to do is to figure out how to compare these thousands of images that we're making with the many thousands of images that we're getting from space to see, first of all, if they're similar enough that we can use the simulations to help us understand the galaxies. And then second of all, to really do a detailed comparison. We're doing it many different ways. We're using computers. We're using human observers professional astronomers, we're using 100,000 volunteers. The Galaxy Zoo Project is going to help us out. They have agreed to take our artificial images mixed with the Hubble images. We don't have to tell them which are which. We know, but they don't know. And they're classifying all of them. And you know, there are so many of them that they're going to classify them as fast as we give them to them. So uh, it's going to be a great uh, project. To summarize, not just this talk, but a lot of what you've heard, the big problems we're trying to solve are the nature of dark matter, the nature of dark energy, which determines the future of the universe, the early evolution of the universe, the form formation of the first tiny galaxies and the first stars, how the universe reionized. Steve Ferlinetto talked about that earlier today. How the entire population of galaxies forms and evolves, from direct observations interpreted with the help of cosmological simulations, including star formation and feedback, formation and feedback from supermassive black holes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This will keep us busy for quite some time. And of course, we'll have various progress and lack of progress to report. And this will be something that I think you may find interesting to cover. Thank you all for coming. I think this has been great fun. And uh, I hope uh, that we can do it again. And thanks especially to Trudy Bell, Sue Grasso, and Nina McCurdy for all of the work organizing it. Of course, it was Trudy who conceived of this and has been the main driving force. And Thanks to the University of California providing the funding. And I, I have actually stayed within the time limit, so I think there's time for some questions. OK, so let's start over here. Well, as I said in that very first talk, uh, we hit the wall on increased speed back in 2004. But the answer has been to just put more and more uh, cores and put them in fancy ways on processors uh, and uh, graphic processor units and other new gadgets. And there's every reason to think that we're going to, in fact, be accelerating even faster than the speed of the upcoming computers. And we have to develop the method to write code that will effectively use these new machines. And that's mainly an, a money issue. We have to convince the funding authorities that instead of just putting all the money into hardware, 
Uh, they have to start putting money into letting us use the hardware effectively. But uh, we're going to keep tackling problems that were impossible to tackle until quite recently. Uh, what Mark Krumholtz was showing you with star formation is, I think, the toughest problem in cosmology, in fact, in astrophysics. Uh, and there's been huge progress recently, but there's still a lot of the physics that's been left out. And uh, please don't misunderstand, when we're doing the galaxy formation, we are fudging the star formation part because it's what we call subgrid physics. But we have to understand it better, and it's the kind of simulations that Mark described that are going to be crucial for understanding it. Uh, the more powerful the computer, the wider the range of scales we can simulate in a physically meaningful way. So it's going to keep getting better and better, and our ability to test is also going to keep getting better because the new cameras are going from hundreds of millions of pixels to billions of pixels, and that's going to give us more and more data, and we're going to read out faster and faster, and we're going to see the transient universe, and uh, we're going to make new discoveries, I think, all the time. The, every time we've opened a new window, we've made new discoveries, and there's lots of new windows that are in progress that you know, we, uh, we're already committed to. Yes? Yes. So who, who's going to write this new code? Is it an astronomer? Is it a computer scientist? And the answer is both. It has to be both. And such people hardly exist. And so one of the things that we want to do is to create a new institute that will train such people. And uh, you know, various campuses of the University of California and other places. And it's not just for astrophysics. It's for all of computational science and engineering. So it's, it's a major requirement for the growth of computational science of all kinds. And uh, I was on a National Academy panel uh, that advised NASA on the future and said this. And, uh, and I hope that uh, the government listens and, because it's, it's absolutely critical. Okay, so how do we go from the end of the simulation of the pretty pictures? And the answer is many different things, because I showed you a bunch of different pretty pictures. So I showed you this thing where there are a lot of little uh, bubble-like things that merged and merged and merged. Okay, so to do that, for every one of the 180 time steps with nearly 10 billion particles each from Bolshoi, we found every dark matter halo in every one. That's about 10 million dark matter halos in every one. And then we compared them one to the next to the next to the next to see which halos merge and merge and merge and merge to make the merger tree. And we follow basically every merger tree for every dark matter halo in the entire simulation. And we've done it twice, two different times, two different codes to get a good sense of exact. And for each halo, we characterize its shape, its angular momentum, the radial distribution, blah, blah, blah. And all that data has either been made public or will shortly be made public. Of course, we've shared that data with our preferred collaborators. And three different groups are building these models of the evolution of the whole galaxy population. And they're doing it completely differently. Incidentally, Darren Croton, who's the head of one of those groups, is the one who did it for the Millennium Simulation. So we're writing a paper together. We're going to have a meeting here at Santa Cruz in a couple months where we're going to compare all the different results and especially highlight the differences because that's what's going to really teach us something and of course compare to observations. So each one of those different stages involves a lot of computation. So, and, and the difference is that the computer doesn't need a lot of attention to run one of these big simulations. But when we do the post-processing, there's a huge amount of human labor involved. And the real limitation isn't computing, it's people. No, no, it's all done on supercomputers. Because when you're dealing with this amount of data, you know, it's, it's 80 terabytes of data just from Bolshoi, and Big Bolshoi was another uh, huge amount of data. And you can't deal with data like that except on a huge machine. So of course, yes, it's all done on, on really powerful machines. Uh, we look at some things on our little workstations, but, but we, mostly it's done on big machines.
as Mike Norman points out, much, much more time, both, phys both clock time and especially people time, in the analysis and the visualization than in the simulation. That's always the case. Earl? Okay. Uh, the actual, actual computer time for one bold, bold joy in millennium. Um, so I don't know how to, what they, the, the way the Europeans do accounting is completely different, so I have no idea how they would account it. Uh, a typical number that you might get, okay, a typical number that you might get for uh, purchasing uh, powerful computer time here would be like 10 cents a CPU hour. And uh, so Bolshoi is a million dollars in round numbers. Uh, I, I think it was less, but I don't know how the Europeans charge. The difference is they own their own supercomputer at the institute that, that ran that simulation. It's probably the same because um, it was the biggest simulation we could do at the time. Yeah. Computers tend to cost the same amount. Yeah, a supercomputer always costs 30 to $100 million, yeah. independent of time for the last 30 years. That, that's been, been there. basically as much as you can get for yeah. one machine. Round numbers. Yes? Well, you said uh, earlier that Millennium is wrong. Would you say the same of Millennium 2, or is that still okay? Millennium 2 was run with the same uh, uh, cosmic parameters. As I say, Simon White, the chief of the project, uh, is very, very stubborn. And, uh, and they're running another one called Millennium XXL, which is, I think, a 50 billion particle simulation. Same wrong parameters. Uh, which, you know, on the one hand, as a scientist, I think is ridiculous, but as a competitor, I think is great. Did he give a reason for why? Yeah, their, their reason was that they wanted to be able to compare the simulations and use the Millennium 2 is the same number of particles in a volume that was 125 times smaller, so much higher resolution. And they wanted to be able to directly compare them. But they made their data public just the way we make our data public. And we did a consistency check, and we showed they were actually not consistent. Whereas we did the same check on our simulation, and Big Bolshoi and Boshe are perfectly consistent. But you know, uh, there will be new simulations coming along. Mike mentioned a huge simulation. I don't know the characteristics of it. But you know, we've got competitors. I hope they, write, they do better simulations, because the field needs you know, better and better. Yes? So, so, so the question is, since the bottleneck isn't the machine time, it's the analysis time, which is really people time, how do we justify spending more money to get the big machines? Uh, and the answer is that we have to spend money not just on the big machines, but also on the people to use the machines efficiently and to analyze. And, you know... It's because the new detectors, they don't just give us more data, they give us different data, which is usually better data. So for example, Widefield Camera 3 is giving us this fabulous infrared data that's letting us see what the galaxies look like in the visible light, which is so useful to characterize them, out to the early universe. And James Webb Space Telescope is going to do even much better. It's a much bigger telescope. It goes further in the infrared. Uh, so it's not just that we're getting more data. We're getting different data. Large, survey, large synoptic survey telescope, it's going to give us this cosmic uh, video. Uh, I think you're asking a balanced question. Well, I guess that's what, it's kind of like when, when you write an article you know, one year and it's, it's the same question that, that you were asking five years, that there's, a, there's a feel, and James and I were talking about this yesterday, that, that there's this kind of pyramid scheme that we're selling to the public that you just have to keep buying and buying and buying. 
buying into. And of course, that's the progress of the market. Well, OK. Now, look, the, the weird thing about cosmology and astronomy in general is that it is absolutely useless. And yet, <laughs> no, no, I mean, it has no economic value whatever, which is the reason that I can say proudly that our data is non-proprietary. We love to make it public. NASA requires that we make it public. This is great, because it has no commercial value. But, but nevertheless, price. governments all around the world, the Chinese government, the Indian government, the Japanese government, the American, the Europeans, are spending billions of dollars a year to give us these wonderful new instruments. It's like the cathedrals of the present era. Uh, this shows that somehow the human race really cares about cosmology. Maybe it's because of what Sandy was saying last night, that in some sense, astronomy is really important to the way we think about ourselves. Maybe it's because of Carl Sagan, who popularized astronomy so effectively 30 years ago. Whatever the reason, as a professional in the field, I am incredibly grateful. Uh, <laughs> And, and I'm also tremendously grateful to the news media for popularizing the work that we do. Because without that, there's no way that we'd get the kind of support that we do. This has been a fantastic era in the history of astronomy. There's never been anything like it. We keep calling it the golden age. Because we are making these fabulous discoveries. Dark matter, dark energy. But we still don't know the nature of either one. So we have, every time we learn something new, we get these wonderful new questions. And I keep telling my students who sometimes worry that we've discovered too much and there won't be enough left for them, don't worry. <laughs> All the biggest questions are still left. And incidentally, I didn't even list the really big questions. Why is the universe like this and not like something else? Why is there so much dark matter and so little ordinary matter by comparison, et cetera, et cetera? And why so much dark energy? We would love to know. We don't know even how to answer a question like that yet. <laughs>